Welcome, my friends, to the Bob and Brad podcast produced by Bob and Brad, the two most famous physical therapists on the internet. I am Bob, and I'm exactly one half of the Bob and Brad team. Today, my guest is an orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Brent Warner. And Dr. Brent Warner does a lot of arthroscopic surgery. Uh, he does the shoulder and the knee and even the hip sometimes. But today, we're going to talk about knee uh, menisci or meniscus and ACL surgeries and also shoulder rotator cuff repairs. So enjoy the program and you'll you'll definitely will learn something. Welcome to the program, Dr. Warner. Hi, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Again, the appreciation is all on this end. <laughs> so let's I'm gonna jump right into it. Um, let's sure. get started. Um, could you give us your backstory? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I actually, I, I'm not native to Minnesota. I grew up in Northeast Ohio. Um, I was a, a multi-sport kid growing up, you know, soccer, basketball, track, skiing, kind of anything I could get wow. my hands on and, and get involved in. Um, my primary sport kind of ended up becoming track and field where of all things, I was a pole vaulter. Really? Uh, yeah. So, uh, that's, that's kind of what I wanted to do in college. And so I got recruited a handful of places. I went to Duke university for undergrad, wow. was a four year member of the track team there. Um, for a while I was even the school record holder. I think that's since been broken, wow. but, um, had a pretty, pretty successful pole vaulting career. Um, I, you know, during, during college really kind of decided that medicine was, was for me having grown up as an athlete and, and that sort of thing. I, I kind of had this dream of wanting to work with young athletes and, and help them, you know, get better when they had injuries and things. So I decided to go to medical school, honestly, with the intention, I, I thought of wanting to be an orthopedic surgeon and, mm. and clearly that stuck. Um, but I went to, to medical school at Ohio state. So back a little closer to home for that. Um, moved on from there to residency at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Uh, uh -huh. And then the last year of training uh, was at the Stedman Philippon Clinic in Vail, Colorado. Um, that's, uh, you know, really one of the kind of premier orthopedic uh, clinics really in the world, definitely the U.S., um, and so I got to spend a year out there with a handful of other trainees like myself, uh, and then their world-class, you know, group of, of surgeons and instructors to really subspecialize in the, the orthopedic sports medicine world. Um, and, and then I wound up here in Minnesota. Uh, I was, you know, kind of open to going just about anywhere, uh, that, uh, you know, would be a good opportunity mm -hmm. for me to, to see the types of patients I wanted to see and do the types of surgery that I wanted to do. Uh, and via some connections, uh, uh my wife and I, and, and my family, we wound up here in the twin cities and, and it's been great. Uh, we have absolutely loved it. Um, uh, feels like home to us now, even though we're not from here. And, uh, you know, my practice is really, uh, been been excellent so far. Kind of everything I could have hoped for. Well, very impressive background. I, I do have to ask, what was the record? I mean, what's the yeah. height? <laughs> yeah, so I jumped just shy of of seventeen and a half feet. That was oh my, my, my ultimate best. Um, I, I actually managed. I was a, an all American one year. I finished oh. top eight in the country at nationals, and so I, I like I said, I had a pretty good career. Very proud of that, even today. You pole vaulters are a little bit crazy. Uh, that's <laughs> yeah, I, I think so. But I think it gives me a nice perspective, you know, when I see patients right. who are into these kind of, you know, fringy, uh, not quite mainstream sports, you know, I know where they're sure. coming from. I know why they're, you know, why, why they can get excited about it and are really drawn into it because that was me, you know? Sure, exactly. Um, so let's see, I want to talk to you about, uh, first of all, I like to mention right away at the beginning um, how to reach you. So sure. that, so that people, if they play back the recording, they can hit it right away. Absolutely. So, um, your website, um, your locations. And yeah. So I, I work for summit orthopedics. Uh, we're here in the twin cities. Uh, for the most part, we are kind of East Metro, the St. Paul side of things based, although we are kind of gradually expanding and getting a bit more of a West Metro presence. Um, so the easiest place to find me would be on our website, which is just www.summitortho.com. Um, if you go there, you know, there's, there's phone numbers for calling for scheduling and that sort of thing. And then we all, myself and all my partners have, uh, biography pages on there. So those are pretty easy to find. Uh, it's under like the providers section. Uh, so you can kind of read my whole background there. And there's a handful of like, you know, videos and other things on some of our interests and things that we treat. 
Um, and so that would be the easiest way. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, we've got multiple locations. I predominantly work out of three of those, um, which are Egan, Lakeville, and Woodbury. How long have you been there? Yeah. Uh, so I have been with Summit now for, gosh, what, about six and a half years. Uh, wow. I finished my fellowship training in early 2015. And so started here with Summit uh, later that, that summer, kind of early fall 2015. So can you talk about the uh, population that you serve? I mean, is it just yeah. athletes or are you non-athletes too? No, uh, really everybody, you know, athletes and non-athletes. The way I like to think of it is, is you know, everybody uh, is an athlete in their own way, right? You know, we are all Agreed. running ultra marathons or playing basketball five nights a week. Sometimes your, your sport, your activity is, you know, walking your dog around the lake or around the block or, or whatever it is, right? And so athletes come in all shapes, all sizes, all ages, uh, all abilities. And so really, I think my primary goal, well, I love working with young athletes because I was one myself. Uh, you know, really what my focus and, and hope is, is that we're trying to keep people active, right? You know, when sure. they have an injury or they have pain, we're doing what we can to try to get them back to that, that sport, quote unquote, no matter what it is. So you'll see some elderly too or not? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I really, yeah, all ages from, from sure. kids all the way up through folks, uh, you know, the elderly uh, to try to help them with their problems. And, you know, sometimes it turns out I might not be the, the, the best provider for that patient. If it's say an older patient with arthritis who might need a, a knee replacement or a hip replacement. And sure. we have, you know, I have great partners here at Summit Orthopedics who do focus in those things. And so it's nice to have that here where we really have the kind of the full gamut of care. And so if I'm not the, the perfect person for that patient, I, I know somebody who would be. And you provide uh, physical therapy too, correct? Yeah. yeah, yeah. We have uh, physical therapy at, at most all of our locations. Uh, we have imaging, uh, MRI, and oh, fant, spray at nice. many of yeah. our locations. Um, bracing. So yeah, we we really kind of can do just about everything uh, here at our offices. It's great. Well, Doctor Warner, uh, we're going to first talk about cartilage in your knees. Yeah, and I say cartilage because that's how the layperson office says it, but uh, mainly torn cartilage. And am I right in saying there's mainly two types of cartilage in your knee? Yeah. Um, so when an orthopedic surgeon says the word cartilage, typically what he or she really is talking about there is, is what we call the articular cartilage. So all the joints in our body, you know, joints basically are where two bones come together and meet. And at that location where they meet, that's the joint. That joint is going to be held together by some number of ligaments surrounded by a lining or a joint capsule. And then on the inside of that capsule, the ends of the bones are gonna be covered in a material called articular cartilage. So I like to think of that as like the, the bearing surface, right? So that's gonna be very low friction, smooth cartilage. And that's really what lets your joint kind of slide and glide. So when your knee bends and straightens, for example, those cartilage surfaces are kind of rubbing, you know, smoothly against one another. And we find that in, in all of our joints. Um, in the knee, you know, kind of the more maybe lay terminology of cartilage, people are often referring to the menisci. So that's a different form of cartilage that's kind of specific to the knee. Um, while the menisci are made up of a, a cartilage material, essentially, they are going to be a little more kind of soft and spongy. Um, and they really are a, a cushion, a shock absorber in the knee. Um, so yeah, when people come in and they talk to me about, you know, having had cartilage procedures in the past, or they've been told they have cartilage damage in their knee, we really have to distinguish which of those two things we're, we're truly talking about. And as I said, you know, most surgeons or, or folks like me, and they say cartilage, they're going to mean more of that articular cartilage. If we're talking about meniscus, we're going to use the word meniscus. Do you operate on both? Yeah, we do. Um, meniscus, I would say, is certainly more common, uh, but absolutely, yes. Uh, you know, people can sustain damage to that articular cartilage, uh, and we do a, a number of different surgical procedures to address that based upon what that injury looks like and what part of the knee or other joint might be involved. Can you, uh, let's talk about the meniscus. Uh, can you describe some of the common ways that it can be injured in the young and the old? The, yeah. The, the that, differences. Yeah, that's actually a really useful way to break it down in my mind. Um, for the most part, meniscus tears in younger people, say under age 30 or 35, more commonly than not, those are going to be kind of an acute injury type of scenario. 
So, um, you know, they're playing a sport. That's an obvious an example. Um, they, you know, get hit in an abnormal way, or they maybe plant to cut and pivot and kind of twist that knee. And that sort of thing can damage the meniscus and cause a tear. We'll also see them pretty commonly with other associated injuries inside of the knee. So for example, like tears of the ACL or other ligaments. Now, once you get a bit older, meniscus tears tend to be more what we would term degenerative. So as we age and our tissues kind of age with us, right, they can become, you know, kind of damaged or, or degenerated and that can weaken the tissue. Uh, and so that can lead to tears as well. Uh, many times, you know, you don't even need a serious injury to cause some of those damages. So sometimes we'll see, you know, older folks who come in with knee pain and they'll have a meniscus tear and really not have an obvious idea of where and how it developed. And it's probably more of that degenerative process. And um, am I right in saying the little pieces can break off and sometimes they can get reabsorbed by the body yeah. or not? Yeah, you know, so pieces certainly can can sort of breakaway. I would say it's really uncommon to see a piece of meniscus tear truly completely away where it would become like free floating or what we term a loose body inside of the knee. Sure. Um, if we, if we see a loose body in the knee, that's often more likely to be that other type of cartilage sure. gotcha. that has kind of come free and, and is loose in the knee. Some of those very small ones can kind of resorb, we think. Um, but meniscus ones, I, I suppose, very small one, there's a chance that it could more likely what we see in a meniscus tear is where a, a portion of that, what we usually term a flap of the meniscus, uh, becomes kind of displaceable, meaning it can kind of shift and move and get caught in an abnormal position in the knee. And that's often some of the symptoms we ask about when people come in, you know, are you having catching or locking or clicking sure. the knee that might indicate something like that going on? And that's uh, more apt, you're going to be more likely to do surgery on those, correct? Correct. Yeah. Um, yeah. When we get those mechanical symptoms, that's sort of the catch-all term for that. Um, more likely than not, I tend to see those patients needing surgery. Oftentimes we can improve their pain with non-operative things, but often those mechanical symptoms will persist. Uh, and sometimes the only way to alleviate those is to do surgery. All right. Let's talk about some other injuries oh, with the meniscus. Uh, are the cases where it can heal on its own? Um, <laughs> probably the right way to answer that is it depends, you know? Um, sure. I, I, yes. I think some small proportion of meniscus tears can, can heal themselves. And part of this is because a lot of those we probably never even knew about, right? Sure. You know, the patient had maybe some fairly minor injury to their knee, their knee bothered them for a few days or a few weeks. And that might've been a small meniscus injury that eventually healed and went away, right? Um, or a mild old sprain or something like that. So, you know, we never would have quote unquote known about those tears exactly, right? Um, the conventional wisdom though, is that most meniscal tears are not going to heal themselves. Um, it's not a very vascular tissue. What that means is that it doesn't have a very robust blood supply to it. Sure. It's sort of hard for the body to get, you know, nutrients to that tissue to get it to heal. Um, because of that, um, you know, kind of the classic thinking on meniscus tears, um, there's this, this thing called the zone concept. So the meniscus is, is kind of shaped like a C. And um, so around the outer edge of that C, that's where all of the little blood vessels kind of come in and perforate into that tissue. So tears that are in that sort of outer zone closest to those blood vessels, those ones are the ones that we think are more likely to have the ability to heal themselves. As you kind of progress further inward into the middle or more kind of inner zones, that blood supply gets kind of less and less substantial and therefore tears are, are going to become sort of less likely to heal. Um, that zone concept has maybe gotten a little bit antiquated to be very honest. Really? Um, you know, yeah, you know, historically there were a, a lot of meniscal tears that were, um, treated by removing them, uh, because they were thought not to have the ability really to heal at all. And, and I think there's something of a generational shift going on in orthopedics right now where a lot of tears that we used to think couldn't heal, we, we now think they can. Some of that has to do with a new understanding of the biology of, of how these things heal. Um, I think a fair part of that as well boils down to, we just have better techniques and instrumentation now. You know, um, the, the initial techniques and, and instruments that we had to repair menisci were a little bit primitive and, and sort of difficult to use to some extent sure. back, you know, decades ago. Now those things have become a little more modernized. Uh, and so 
uh, you know, younger surgeons like me, I think we were probably repairing a lot more menisci than they used to classically, uh, because we have found that some can heal with surgical help, you know, uh, without surgery, the likelihood that, that one of these tears heals is, is again, fairly low. Um, but yes, some can certainly heal if we do the right things to it. More likely in a younger person or not? Correct. Yeah. You know, for the most part, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we see a lot of tears uh, in more kind of degenerative conditions in older patients. And those ones, because we know that tissue has some intrinsic damage to it, probably its ability to heal is, is somewhat less. So for the most part, on the whole, yes, meniscus repairs are going to be more likely attempted in younger patients. Although again, we're seeing in a bit uh, with this kind of shift in thinking that, you know, we're, we're pushing the limits out a little bit. Some older patients are having repairs done of certain types of tears. Uh, I think one of those types of tears we're going to talk about a little bit later right. where we are repairing this guy and some older folks. Um, but yes, on the whole, I would say most municipal repairs, those are going to be in younger patients, say, you know, under age 30 or 35. Sure. Makes sense. Yeah. So um, I'm going to ask you, how many of these have you done, would you say? I mean, just rough oh, estimate. I mean, yeah. Um, you know, meniscus injuries are, are really one of the most common knee injuries. Yes, we I see. saw that. Um, yeah. 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 Uh, and so, you know, we see, certainly see them all the time. Um, you know, again, some can be treated without the need for surgery. Uh, the ones that need surgery, though, it's, it's one of the more common types of surgery I do. Um, uh, gosh, it's hard to estimate, you know, the what we call a partial meniscectomy, uh, where we end up removing the damaged part of the meniscus. That's probably the more common one on the whole. Sure. Um, and that's got to be, oh gosh, between 50 and 100 a year, I would guess. Wow. Probably something like that. Meniscal repairs, uh, again, a little less common than that, but still, I would say somewhere on the order of, you know, coming up to maybe 50 or so in a year, 50 to 60, um, uh, where we're going ahead and doing a repair. See, I think you're in that uh, wonderful zone where you've done a lot of surgeries, but you're not, yeah. you're young yet. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, that, that's what I always looking for. So, um, let's talk about uh, if let's say you have a young athlete with a tear. What are some of yeah. the decisions you're making? What are the you know the approach? Yeah. Yeah. So that younger patient, um, really, you know, what we would term as meniscal preservation is very, very important. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, the job of the meniscus is, is as a cushion. It's a shock absorber inside of the knee. So when a person walks, jumps, lands, you know, does all the things they would do to, to transmit force through that knee joint, the meniscus is trying to absorb that and kind of distribute that force out evenly over the whole interior surface area of the knee. And so if the meniscus becomes damaged and it can no longer do that shock absorbing job, other parts of the knee begin to take up that stress. So that's the other type of cartilage that we talked about earlier that starts to see that stress. The bone starts to see that stress. And so those things over time can really start to lead to arthritis developing in that joint. So in a young person, we really try hard to avoid that scenario. We would like to, if, if we can in any way, preserve the meniscus that usually means trying to repair any tear or damage we would see so that that meniscus can still serve that function and hopefully protect the knee going forward. When you re say repair, are you actually going yep. there and put stitches in there? Yep, absolutely. Yeah, there's, there's a number of different kind of techniques for how to do that, but they all boil down to that basic, basic approach is, is yes, we're putting sutures, stitches into the meniscus to kind of, you know, pull that tear back together, get that tissue to be uh, opposed again uh, and heal. So what, you know, what happens if you find out it didn't heal? I mean, yeah. Yeah, it's a good question because there are some tears that, that won't heal and that can either be because the, the damage was too substantial you know, sometimes, unfortunately, patients don't do exactly what we ask them to right. do. You know, there's a number of things that can lead to that. But Very yes, that common. can happen. Yeah, uh, that can happen. Or honestly, even healed tissue can sometimes get injured again, right? It sure. can, can re-tear. So um, it depends a lot on, on really how that, that tear looks, right? I would say if it was a healed tear that re-tore, uh, again, a young patient, we might often try to repair that again. Um, maybe via a slightly different technique or sort of adding some, some augments to that, you know, trying to help the body heal a little bit better. Um, if it is one where that tissue just, you know, it looks like it never had a chance to heal because it was too damaged, then yes, we, we may be left only with the option of removing that damaged portion of the tissue. 
That's called a partial meniscectomy. Gotcha. Um, meniscectomy is still a good surgery, right? It does alleviate pain from meniscus tears quite reliably for most people. The real downside of that surgery is then that patient has less meniscus inside of their knee, right? They don't have okay. as much of that shock absorbing cushion effect. And so we know that those patients really based upon how much of the meniscus is removed, they, they will see that, that risk for arthritis kind of increase based upon the amount of, of tissue they've lost. Well, speaking of arthritis, let's talk about the elderly person now that comes yeah. in to see you with a tear. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, again, you know, we, we are less likely to consider repair in, in the older patients. Now there are a few exceptions to that, which I think we'll get to in a bit. Uh, but for the most part, the mainstay of treatment, at least surgically for that type of patient, uh, is, is to remove that part of the meniscus, do that partial meniscectomy. Now, not every single meniscus tear needs surgery. And in fact, something that's interesting about meniscal tears is that they're, they're remarkably common just out there walking around in the world. If we were to just get an MRI of every person on the street, you would see a fair number of completely asymptomatic incidental little meniscus tears. Once as, the patient as, doesn't even know. As you get older. Yeah, exactly. Right. You know, the, the rates of that would be considered really low in, in a young patient. But once you get over, say, age 50 or 60, uh, you know, those rates can be up. Uh, some studies say, you know, maybe as many as 40 to 50 percent of patients might have a little meniscus damage that they don't even really know about. So if someone comes in with a, a, a tear of their meniscus and we think that that's the thing causing their symptoms, if, if that tear is fairly minor, uh, if their pain is not particularly severe, if they're not having any of those mechanical type symptoms, uh, a lot of those can be treated successfully without needing surgery. Uh, and so that may be, you know, they go to physical therapy to get stronger, to work on their balance, to work on their gait mechanics, uh, to just look at the way that they kind of go about their day and try to adjust some of those things to avoid maybe putting un, you know, abnormal or undue sure. stress on their knee. Um, you know, typical over-the-counter medications like Tylenol or Advil or Motrin, those can all be very, very helpful. Uh, and then we'll also sometimes try injections inside of the knee, things like cortisone, which are, are nice uh, anti-inflammatories that can really help alleviate pain, swelling, those types of things. Great. Um, well, let's get to that unusual one that uh, yeah. it's, it's just been kind of recently discovered, right? Or, yeah. I mean... Yeah, you know, so so what we're talking about here is something called a meniscal root tear. So as I mentioned earlier, the, the meniscus is kind of C-shaped. Um, at the ends of the C, the meniscus sits, you know, on top of the tibia, the shin bone. Uh, and the meniscus is actually anchored there to the tibia at the front and back at those ends of the C. And those are called the root attachments. Uh, and what they have shown with some really good studies over the last, uh, you know, handful of years is that those root attachment points are really vital to the function of the meniscus. Probably this is not really a new injury per se. This probably has been going on for, you know, as long as humans have been around. But I think what has really changed here is our ability to, to kind of recognize them with imaging such as, as MRI, ultrasound, those types of things. Uh, and then also, again, to understand really what the consequence of one of these tears, what it can be on the knee. So what they've shown in some of these studies is that if you have a, a tear of the root of your meniscus, it from a biomechanical perspective is almost like having no meniscus in your knee at all. They've done some oh, pretty wow. good uh, research with like cadaver knees and things and creating these injuries. And they show that then the force transmission there in the knee becomes like having no cushion there at all. So the worry becomes if you have a tear like that, you now are at markedly increased risk for that arthritis we were talking about earlier, that car, other cartilage, the bone that starts to take up additive stress. And, and there are certainly instances out there where people will see pretty rapid development of that over, you know, months to even just a few years. So um, that, that with our increased recognition of that and what that can do to a person's knee, we have become much more uh, attuned to these injuries and quite frankly, aggressive about trying to repair them. So the goal of that surgery uh, is to, to reattach that, that root attachment to the bone. Um, that's typically done with an arthroscopic surgery. Some stitches are put into the meniscus. Typically kind of a, a tunnel or a little hole is drilled through the bone of the tibia where those stitches get kind of pulled down in through that hole. And that's what anchors the, the meniscus back to the bone and it can actually heal there. Um, we see that injury most typically in folks in their middle age. So between say 45 and 65 years of age, 
Um, and so, uh, whereas historically it was pretty rare to see a meniscal repair surgery in a patient that age, uh, I'm now doing those quite regularly. Um, you know, this has become honestly one of the more common injuries that I see, um, because I kind of have an interest in it and my training kind of helped me with learning how to recognize and see these. Uh, I I've got, you know, a lot of partners here in my group and around town who have started kind of really sending these my direction, uh, because uh, I've seen a lot of them and really know, know how to address them well. Do we know what percentage of cares tend to be a um, meniscal repair? Gosh, that's a good question. I, I guess I don't know what the overall incidence might be. I'm not sure I've looked that number up. I would say in my practice, it's probably about a quarter of the meniscus tears I see. I don't think that's probably representative. I think I, think, uh, I saw five to 10% or something like that. But. Yeah, I, that, that would not surprise me as the real number. Uh, like I said, I, I think my practice has become a little subspecialized in that. Sure. So I certainly see more regularly than the average. So if a young person gets this, like yeah. let's say you're 25, um, yeah. what I saw is that if you don't do anything and, or if you don't repair it, you could have yeah. a, t- a total knee replacement coming toward you within five That's years. True. That's exactly right. You know, as I said, you can see really remarkably quick progression of arthritis, you know, a knee that, that looks so pretty even a young, Even a young person. Even in a young person, oh, yeah, wow. I think that's probably a little less likely than an older person who sure. might already have the pre-existing damage there. But yeah, um, and so while we see these root tears, you know, a little less commonly in younger people, um, they can happen, and yeah, they can have really dramatic consequences on the knee. You know, maybe the most uh, typical way we would see a root tear in a young patient is. Um, there's a version of that that actually involves the lateral meniscus, the one on the outside of the knee. That was a bit less common in the older patient, but we'll see a lateral root tear uh, in young people who have ACL injuries, ACL tears. Oh, sure. Uh, You know, I think for a long time, those were sort of under-recognized or or at least their consequences were sort of under-appreciated. And so, uh, again, we've become more and more sort of uh, cognizant of those and I think more consistent with our approach to them in terms of typically repairing that alongside doing any other work we might have to do. Do they present themselves differently from a clinical standpoint when they come in? The, the older patients, yeah, those middle-aged kind of the classic ones, uh, they, they do tend to have a fairly typical presentation. What I most often see is that um, for some period of time, say weeks or maybe a couple of months, they kind of develop a more minor sort of pain in their knee. Oftentimes that's more towards the inside or sometimes in the back of their knee that they notice with with normal daily activities, but that pain is typically fairly livable. They typically have treated themselves with things like, you know, Advil or Motrin or ice or heat, and and that has helped for some period of time. Um, And then what will often happen is they will have sort of a sudden episode where they typically feel a, a pop inside of their knee and they are suddenly in really significant pain, usually for two or three days. They might not even be able to fully put weight on that leg and walk around on that knee. And that often will happen with, with pretty benign, normal, everyday types of activities. You know, people walking up or down the stairs, getting in and out of their car, uh, you know, things that you would do without thinking uh, on a given day uh, where that, you know, kind of weakened root tissue. That's what we think is going on there. That tear has maybe been kind of partial or sort of slowly progressive over those weeks where they were having pain. Uh, and then some, you know, just bit of too much force or, or you know, an abnormal way to kind of move that knee is enough to, to cause that tear. So typically when they come to see me, they have usually just kind of recently had that abrupt kind of change where their pain got worse. Uh, they may have seen someone else before me and gotten an MRI already. Uh, and typically we're, we're talking about that when they come to see me in the office. So the pain gets worse and it does not get better, correct? Yeah. Well, it usually is pretty severe for the first couple of days, two days, sure. three days is common. It does improve somewhat after that, you know, usually to the point that they're able to kind of move around and walk on it again, but still hurts and certainly worse than whatever they had been dealing with kind of prior to that over those preceding weeks or months. So is it possible because this is a kind of a new thing? I mean, if you're out in some rural area with a practicing orthopod that been doing this for 30 years and has no yeah. colleagues and isn't keeping up yeah. on the latest. I mean, is it possible they'll miss this? 
Absolutely. I, sort of a funny story. I, I have a, a woman in my a patient of mine who um, she was in her late sixties, if I remember correctly, who had one of these injuries in her knee and I, I repaired it. You know, we kind of went through discussing why we would want to repair it and wanted to make sure she could kind of do all the appropriate rehab and recover. And so we did it and she did, she did wonderfully well. Um, she lives about half the time here in Minnesota, the other half the time in Arizona where it's warmer. Sure. And so a year or two after we had done this surgery, she was, you know, during her time in Arizona and she actually sustained the same injury to the opposite knee. Oh, God. And she went and saw a surgeon there in Arizona where she lived and she walked in and the guy said, I've never heard of that injury before. You should fly back to Minnesota. Oh, <laughs> so wow. She came back and saw me and we diagnosed her appropriately and we ended up doing surgery on her other knee too. And, and she's done beautifully. Uh, but uh, yeah, so it certainly, I think there are, there are, you know, some, some older surgeons out there. That's and worrisome. I, 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 yeah, I know. Yeah, um, well, yeah. But yeah. You know, where it's, yeah, maybe not gotten completely through, you know, everywhere in the country where people are recognizing these and addressing them. That seems like a really difficult surgery. Um, I mean, do you ever have to open the knee to get in there or? There are some tricks to kind of, you know, make a little more uh, room to, to work and to see, um, you know, one thing that we'll often do. So this is, again, typically going to be the medial meniscus, the one on the right. inside of the knee. Um, and, and it's in the back. So we use our tiny little arthroscopic camera, which usually lets us see back there. Every once in a while, we'll have somebody who has a very kind of tight knee or a very tight space. And one little trick we can do, it sounds honestly a little bit barbaric, but the MCL is the, the large ligament on the inside of the knee that kind of prevents that part of the knee from gapping open. Um, we can take a little needle during surgery and poke a little tiny holes in that MCL, which will allow it to kind of stretch just a wow. bit. It's almost like purposely creating a sprain, sure. uh, you know, kind of a little partial tire, a little partial tear in that ligament. It gives us just an additional, you know, a few millimeters of working room, but sometimes really can, can be, uh, the key to getting this surgery done well and not honestly causing other additional damage to the knee. Um, you know, the last thing we want to do is when we're trying to put instruments in and out of the knee, we don't want to damage the other cartilage in there. And so sometimes right. by causing that little MCL sprain, uh, we can do our surgery better. Uh, the nice thing about that is the MCL heals up great. Sure. Uh, so we are already going to be rehabbing that patient with a brace and on crutches for their meniscus. That's the exact same way we would typically treat an MCL sprain. So those two rehabs kind of go together. Um, and, and there are basically no long-term consequences of doing that. Well, if you're worried you have a meniscus uh, root tear, uh, you can find Dr. Warner at summitortho.com. S-U-M-M-I-T-O-R-T-H-O. Dot com.